And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, <laughs> the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible, with or without me fucking up my own intro. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. One of the lead coordinators of the unofficial Elder Scrolls RPG, the game that can actually unironically say that it just works. The one and only Set. How you how you doing tonight, man? I'm doing pretty good. I am neither um, drunk nor batshit crazy. I'm trying to trying to see if I caught all three of those. But you um, go okay. you go on T you go on TG. I think that I think the latter is applicable. Okay, that's fair. As a blanket category, then yes, I, I fall into bad shit crazy. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll accept that proudly. Um, um, but happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yep. Yeah. Now, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings around here. So, and there's two, there's two approaches I can take with it. The first is, what got you, what got you into RPGs and what was it that made it stick? Um, that is especially in the context of the game we're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. kind of a long answer. Um, but basically, um, I started playing Dark Heresy, the Fantasy Flight Warhammer 40K role-playing game in mm -hmm. college because of Warhammer 40K, which was kind of my original um, tabletop hobby love. Like, I started playing 40K when I was, like, 10 years old, back in 4th edition, um, and I still play it today. What's your what? Just out of curiosity, where do you lean when it comes to your armies? Uh, so I have two thousand or more painted points of Harlequins, Tau, Craft Worlds, and Necrons, and I am working on Carcharodons uh, for Space Marines. Weeb. So Minos, aliens out the wazoo, and then you know poster boys because why not? Still weeb. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean I know. I get the I get the tower criticism, but um, then I pull out my Harlequins and people are like, "What what the hell is that?" Although, although these days they're really good. Um, although although it's not like it's not like I'm one it's not like I'm one to talk given the given some of the ridiculously unfair um I I G slash Salamander um armies that I've used over the years, <laughs> including yep, I'm more than familiar, <laughs> including the times where I actually got away with the Creed maneuver. Hmm. <laughs> I Classic. did, although um, I didn't use Warhound Titans with that because I didn't have any. Mm -hmm. Mostly, mostly because I mostly because I work for a living. Yeah, um, no, the size of a small child. But I did, I did have, I did have, um, I did have plenty of, I did have a few Bane Blades and a few, um, a, f a few, t a few Terminus Land Raiders. Oh, those things! Oh my God! Yeah, I remember those. Yeah, the the thing you the thing you break out when you when somebody is so proud of their of their fancy decked out armor. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, and yes, I know that there's a risk of las cannons blowing up, but the dice guys would have to really hate me in order for that to happen. Like it's a literal one in a thousand chance, chance because you've got to roll nothing but ones. But you'll find a way. <laughs> It's 40k. <laughs> It'll always happen. <laughs> um, At least when you don't want it to. The only time, the only time I've ever, I've ever been afraid of rolling ones is the Doom Rider incident. Hmm. I'm, I'm almost afraid to ask. Um, Doom Rider became a. Every, are you familiar with the meme of Doom Rider? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know. Yeah, Doom it's, it's a kid. He had a he had a rule where if you roll where if you rolled a one, if you rolled a one even on the turn that he was summoned, he would disappear. Oh, the turn he comes. Oh no, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so I assume pop in, pop out. Yes. Hello, goodbye. Got it. Pop in, pop out, and he doesn't come back. So you've basically wasted those points. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a very Games Workshop kind of rule. <laughs> yeah. Um. Nice. But given, but given how, given how, um, given how the um, 40k community hates fun, I had to phase out some of my more memeable armies with time. Mm -hmm. um, 
simply because a lot of it, a lot of it got nerfed because apparent apparently they'd rather have me using um u using ultra smurfs and suicide charges inst instead of firing lines hmm. um that but um it's it's interesting that you it's interesting that you bring up um dark heresy because mm -hmm. Before Fantasy Flight Games took it over, originally that was going to be through um, Games Workshop's Black Industries label. Yes. Yeah, the original, um, some of those characters and some of those stories, I, I don't want to say Eisenhorn was invented for that purpose, but I think he might have been the character. I'm not 100% sure, but some of that original content around the Inquisition was invented because of Dark Heresy or because they wanted to launch something like it. Um, and then it kind of got shunted into fantasy flight at some point. I think. Um, from what it, from what I understand, it was a case of the, of them of them deciding to kill off their um, extra extraneous labels for a good amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, this is this this has happened a few times with say the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game where they yeah. they um, ignore it for a while and then they br then they bring it back. Um, mm -hmm. Most recently, it's been happening with um, Blood Bowl. Where yeah. that got ne that got neglected for years, and now they're tr now they're trying to bring it back, mm -hmm. um, probably because of how well um, Blood Bowl Two, when it came to the video game version, did. Although, I um I am of the opinion that instead instead of trying to replicate the board game, a video game version of Blood Bowl should in should instead take its cues from say NFL Blitz or something like that. Hmm. Yeah, that like could be NFL, fun. NFL. NFL Blitz or Mutant League Football, basically just that kind of that. The whole thing is meant to be is meant to be a joke on American football, so why not go full speed with it? Yeah, may as well. Um, but now, as far as the Eisenhorn thing, I think I think that was already established, and there was there was one um, little experiment they did at one point. With a more with a small scale skirmish um, deal called Inquisitor. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. That's that's what I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. That's where the um, a lot of that original content was created for what the game it was created for, and then yeah. a lot of that was merged or pushed off into into Dark Heresy afterwards. Yeah, Eisenhorn. Yeah, I think that was what Eisenhorn was invented for was to promote promote Inquisitor. Yeah, whereas. I always joke that Eisenhorn seemed to seem to be made on a made on a bet to see if to see if somebody could do film noir in the forty first millennium. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not that whether or not that succeeded is up is up to you. I um, enjoyed it. That was a good book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but when it that brings me to the other half of the equation, what was your introduction to the Elder Scrolls series? Oh god. Uh so um Morrowind um on the original Xbox actually of all platforms um my dad was a Microsoft guy so mm -hmm. obviously right had to have the original Xbox. Um and uh we literally like I saw the game cover like in the box art uh in a blockbuster um like the year that it came out and for whatever reason whatever was on the back of the box I don't even remember possessed me to rent it and not only did i like it my sister liked it and my dad liked it and so we went and we bought a copy and played the hell out of it for like a year two years maybe um you know kind of taking turns so it's it's a lot of like childhood nostalgia um kind of wrapped up in in my m confusing love affair with the elder scrolls <laughs> mm -hmm. um for me, for me personally, I um, my introduction was my introduction was Daggerfall. Nice. So that's that's how far back I go with mm -hmm. I go with it for better and for worse. Um, that said, I will I I do firmly believe that when it comes to Morrowind, whoever designed Cliff Racers can go, can um can get keelhauled. I still hear it. In my in my waking nightmares. <laughs> well, what makes it worse is some is is somebody who apparently hates fun decided to make a mod decided to make a mod of of it that go that goes full Hydra with the damn things. Yeah, every time you kill one, they like multiple. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, no, I, I believe it. Um, 
but give but given that given that was it was it just a, um was it dur was it during the moral was it dur was it would was it during say the oblivion days that the foundation for for trying to do a elder scrolls rpg started or did it start a whole lot later um no actually uh i would say it would live in between that time period around um the release of Skyrim and the Elder Scrolls Online. Basically, there was a period after Skyrim hit in, I think, 2011, mm -hmm. something like that, um, where I was kind of generally dissatisfied with the game for a number of reasons, but mostly because I I had kind of invested myself in the setting and I had already felt let down um, by Oblivion in terms of its portrayal of parts of the setting you know, I had become a little bit of a lore junkie, not not as hardcore as other people at the time, but just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then between that time period and the release of Elder Scrolls Online in around 2014, my group, um, well, didn't exist before then, people that I lived with in college started playing Dark Heresy, and I got introduced into the role-playing game world that way. So... All of these ideas were kind of in my mind at the same time. I was thinking about the Elder Scrolls, the lore, the setting, and I was also thinking about tabletop RPGs. I had only just been introduced through Dark Heresy to the entire concept, um, and I thought they were cool because I'd played 40K, right, a, mm -hmm. a war game, an old-fashioned kind of tabletop war game. Um, and so the idea basically began, um, I want to say, in 2013 um, when we were looking to branch out from Dark Heresy. We were kind of bored playing 40K role-playing games, um, or at least I was. Uh, and I was kicking around the idea of trying to create something my group might like. And I was like, hey, why not just take this setting that I like and I love and that I think has had something of a disservice done to it over the years um, and create something that my group can play, which is why the original version of the UES RPG was so very obviously a blatant dark heresy hack because that's exactly what it meant was meant to be because that was all I knew at the time. And give and um, given that given that, would you would you say that would you say that with that early version you were it was um it was a little bit too close to being a to being a hack. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, so I have no illusions about the fact that the original dark heresy was not a good system. Uh, mechanically um it was fun it was flavorful uh it was not smooth or easy to navigate necessarily um and so because my primary goal was just creating something that i could use with my group um i didn't really care about that and then through the process of trying to put that first version together it was literally just you know a word document with rules and some basic formatting and some pictures right mm -hmm. um I kind of got pulled into the the RPG writing side of the whole process and began to enjoy that and then realized pretty much immediately as soon as I was done with the first couple of versions of the, the first edition of the game um, that I could do way better if I was willing to put in the effort and I had some people to help out. And so that's where things really kicked off. And the second and third editions of the game that followed over the next years um, were substantially better uh, as a result of that that choice. Well, since since you brought it up, let's get let's let's get into let's get into that for a, that for a bit. Um, now, I will I will admit that one of the easy low hanging fruit I can go with is the fact that something that's going to elevate the unofficial Elder Scrolls RPG compared to the video game version is that melee combat isn't driz isn't the drizzling shits. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this this has been my, and th this has been my pet peeve with the Elder Scrolls series for years, <laughs> and mm -hmm. every time I bring this kind of thing up, there, I always have some defender saying you can't you can't do detailed melee combat in first person. I'm like, yes, you can. Mach and X did it in 2000. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's all kinds of like niche examples and of that. I'm sure since, you can. Since can you, um, do it? I don't know. <laughs> since you got it, since you um brought up the original Xbox, I'll, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Breakdown in 2004. Hmm. Never played that one. Um, I'm not going to say Breakdown is a, is a great first-person game, but it is an interesting one. And one of the... And even though it's technically a shooter, um, 
because of the because of the fact that you have a certain class of enemy that's bulletproof, you do need to get in close. Mm -hmm. um, it was a pioneer in the sense of do, in the sense of doing co um, constant constant fir constant first person narrative, even with the more detailed stories and for a constant first person in that sense. Yeah, that had been done with Half Life, um, but. Go, but going all in the the way that it did here, instead of just the whole gun with legs approach, was still a novel concept. Gotcha. Um, That's pretty cool. And when it the other the other thing is that I I will admit that I ended up finding out about um about UES RPG right around the time I was start I was starting to be more and more dissatisfied with um with Skyrim. Even though there were some lore issues, I didn't mind um, Oblivion. Mm -hmm. um, the pro the the problem that I had, but when it came to Skyrim, I had problems. Um, I mean, you you would think you would think uh, you think given where I'm com given where I come from that a more Nor a more Norse inspired setting would be up my alley. And visually, that's certainly the case. The big, the big problem was um, advancement start started to feel kind of pointless. Mm -hmm. And then I saw that um, pride thing that um, Todd that Todd Coward had said, <laughs> had said at um, GDC one year, and everything started to fall into place. I'm not familiar. Um, he talked to he he was doing a keynote speech at G, at um GDC, and he and he talked about um about fi about filling players with um pride, and he used the the bombastic sequence at the end of a round of Peggle as his case in point, <laughs> which which is a which is a nut, which yeah it looks nice, but when you when you actually put, when you actually get down to brass tacks, it do, all of that spectacle doesn't really mean much. Mm -hmm. And I've all, I've all, I was already, I was already souring on the on the sense that you're dealing with a game that want, that wants to talk up about how about how you can do how you can do anything, and yet it and yet it has as much of a hate boner for people who want to play fighters as. So many other um, fantasy games over the years. Um, like it, it. And I know, I know, I know that so, I know that there's the defense of um Sky, of Skyrim and Oblivion being kind being kind of classless games, but that but um that doesn't mean that. Do, but if you're gonna take the approach of you can do just about anything, then you can't have one aspect of that just fall to neglect oh yeah for sure oh. they've certainly gone the route of um you know the tr the holy trinity fighter mage thief everything else can just go get bent um aside from you know some combinations of the above mm -hmm. um oh. and the, now now um going from first to to second edition what would aside from the fact that you, that you weren't doing a straight, you weren't doing as straight up of a hack as you were with first edition. What were some of the big takeaways you had from first that you tried to apply to second? Um, honestly, uh, that it was garbage, and I knew nothing about game design um, <laughs> primarily. <laughs> um, but it was it, the audience for first edition was not people; it was a, a small group of my friends, right? Um, and it only became something that was really intended for other people when I realized that there were other people who would be interested in this kind of thing. Um, it was in those kind of early days that I started um, meeting up with people on, um, I think it was the old, uh, it might still be active, I shouldn't call it old, but the old, uh, the SUPTG IRC channels. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, we had a channel for um, the UES RPG where some people would occasionally trickle in from threads um and people like um the seventh 
uh, Anon133, whose usernames you'll see in the um, the credit sections all the way up to and including the third edition of the game, um, became involved early on at that stage. Um, and that was also the time period where I was beginning to branch out along with my play group into other games. Mm -hmm. um, we weren't just playing Dark Heresy, and so I was starting to realize that Dark Heresy mechanically is not a very good game and that what we had created as a result was not that great. Um, I don't know if I would say there was one primary inspiration or, or um, thing that we we looked to do differently. It really was like, let's overhaul this and let's try to do this properly. Um, and that involved just a lot more effort into every aspect of the game, really. Hmm. Um, now, when it came to you expanding your horizons as far as as far as the games you were playing, were, are there any standouts that you that you can mention that served as a influence for you? Well, so this is this is a fun one because uh, people had pointed pointed out uh, some similarities um, in a few design choices. Um, in third edition versus second edition, for example, um, uh, similarities with D and D five E. I had never played D and D until fifth edition, um, and I was introduced to it later on after I had been introduced to pen and paper games in general through Dark Heresy. Um, and I admired, at the very least, uh, its simplicity, um, elegance. In some cases, um, it's not perfect, right? But it, it's obviously a very popular system, and when I was going into second edition, my goal was to create something that people who I didn't know would be interested in playing. Um, and so I figured that to that end, it was probably best if I moved away from something that was very crunchy without much payoff, like Dark Heresy, towards something that was a little simpler, a little more elegant, a little more streamlined, and try to strike the balance between the two. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we did it perfectly, but I think we did an okay job. Um, we definitely stole some mechanics, just just wholesale. Um, there were some things I liked. My group never played this game, but I really liked reading it and looking at the mechanics. Um, RuneQuest, um, specifically RuneQuest 6, uh, we used a lot of inspiration um, from their combat rules to help shape um, some of the way that our combat works. RuneQuest um, 6, a.k.a. Um, I believe, I believe if, if we're dealing with 6, I believe that would later become um, Mithras. Gotcha. Yeah, no, you're probably right. Um, yeah, it, yeah. I actually don't know a ton about RuneQuest at all. I just had literally been going around, downloading all of the games I could find, and just reading mechanics, almost completely divorced from uh, the play experience of the games themselves, which in hindsight might not have been the best way to do it, but I certainly learned a lot about how different authors and, and studios implemented their, um, their vision mechanically. And when it comes... When... When it came when it came to because the um, the transition between being pure um, dark heresy to mm -hmm. to cribbing to cribbing some notes from rune to, from a rune quest slash mythros is something I find interesting and was that was rune quest just one that you that you were tipped off to how did you how did you find out about that one so. It came because of some tension involving the way that the Fantasy Flight systems in general at the time handled combat. Um, it was sort of a uh, the standard, you have an initiative order, uh, I'm going to move, I'm going to take an action, I'm going to roll some dice, we're going to resolve my action like I'm going to make an attack. Um, and there might be some form of uh, active defense on the side of the person who's being attacked. Um, whereas, you know, a game like D&D kind of bakes a lot of their defense into AC, uh, which is just a target number. And I was interested in RuneQuest, or I guess I came across RuneQuest because I was looking for ways to reflect a more complex core interaction mm -hmm. with more information when it came to the, the central combat role. So like if you compare combat in first edition of UES RPG, which I barely even remember, to be honest, um, it was probably very standard dark heresy. You roll to hit. Uh, if you roll under your target number, you know, with with circumstantial modifiers, you hit your target. And maybe there's an active defense roll being made by uh, the target. But in second and third edition, it is definitely um, an opposed kind of system where the attacker is choosing 
the means by which they're attacking and rolling, and the defender is choosing the means by which they are defending. Mm. Um, and very often that involves a role, and it allowed us to flesh out things like the difference between parrying and blocking and evading, these kinds of things that exist as buzzwords within RPG combat systems, but that are sometimes conflated together. Like, you know, is it different if I put my shield in front of something and I tank a blow to the shield versus if I'm using my sword to deftly deflect an attack against me, right? Those feel like they should be different, but in some systems, they're exactly the same. Um, and I also liked how... I, and so I ended up kind of being turned on to RuneQuest in part because of my search for something that could reflect that kind of flow of combat. Um, but also I liked the way that they used, I think they called them like special effects or something. Um, they, they had interesting consequences for the results of a combat roll. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like, oh, I hit you, now I rolled damage. Congratulations, you take three damage. Ooh, that's the most exciting thing ever. It was a little more um, narrative and it was a little more exciting. It was like, oh, I'm not only have I, have I done damage to you, but I'm in an advantageous position and maybe I've, I've tripped you or caused something interesting to happen that's going to change how this combat's going to play out, and it gives the GM and the players something to chew on. Yeah, and the other thing I f the other th thing I find interesting with it is um, with some with something like RuneQuest, um, detailed melee was was all has always been has always been the goal since it since its creator um, had a had a um, had a um, historical background, mm -hmm. um, and. It, and the ex an excellent case in point would be another would be another game that was made by the same guy, that being Pendragon, mm -hmm. um, which, which is kind of using a percentile ver um, system, kind of. Um, but you've you've uh, now obviously I've I've done my fair share of slagging when it comes to the, when it comes to the insistence on using that D that D one hundred system. Mm -hmm. um, in in um dark heresy but mm -hmm. i'm curious as to what's what some of the things that you found to be the most bork or um jank within that system within dark heresy yeah uh most of the problem was that because of how they constructed their and it does come back to largely the way they constructed their d100 system but their their solution to the the natural bounds of the d100 system was um, unnatural characteristics, if you remember that mechanic at all. I do. Uh, yeah, and, and essentially if they wanted to reflect something that was exceedingly tough beyond the boundaries of the normal toughness range in which characters were defined, they basically resorted to multiplying the bonuses involved from which your statistics would derive, and that created weirdness because, I mean, obviously doubling your bonus is sometimes more than what you want to reflect the way that a certain character should operate within the mechanics of the game. Sometimes you just want like two more toughness, not four more because you've doubled it. Um, to say nothing of, you know, unnatural characteristics times three or even God forbid times four. Yeah. Um, so things kind of got weird on the periphery. The edges of the system were kind of weirdly defined and a lot of things that players wanted to use and that we wanted to use in our games did not exist and play very nicely uh, in those spaces. Personally, I th I I've always been of the opinion that one of the other problems was that um, dark Her dark heresy was n was never meant was never meant to be um, Warhammer forty thousand the role playing game. It yeah. was originally meant to be th this one specific styling, and yeah. it got forced into being. Um, um, other other stylings, which is where the problem really started to lie. When now, um, the problem wasn't as bad with the with the um game that they did after that, um, Rogue Trader, because you could you could kind of you could kind of see where things were going a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, even even if some things ha were vast were vastly different from what they were originally, like um, like say how psychers worked. Mm -hmm. But once you get once you get into the high powered stuff with um, Death Watch, especially, yep. I knew you were going to say Death Watch. That's where it all breaks down. <laughs> is where, is where things is where things get borked, and where you have the infamous thing where um where a where a um space marine could theoretically juggle Terminator armor 
because of the the infamous threat of some of somebody deciding to caber toss a chaos marine in in terminator armor yeah all kinds of wacky things <laughs> um plus there's the fact that dark heresy is meant to be a high is meant to be a highly lethal game and how are you going to do high lethality when you're dealing with some of the more larger than life characters on the higher end of the spectrum in the 40k universe yep um, absolutely and of course the other big problem is tr is trying to do crossover material like what mm -hmm. like if you if you looked in the core book for um rogue for rogue trader or only war or yes death watch again or mm -hmm. black or black crusade or black crusade kind of the uh, kind of the odd man out um there will be there'll sometimes be this blurb in the first chapter about um about what character ranks would be equivalent to starting characters in this and the pro the problem is if, if i if say if say i want to do a ca a campaign where a where a um a ro a a rogue a uh, rogue trade a rogue trader is 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 helping out is helping out a detachment of space marines um, mm -hmm. trying to balance that out is going to make my brain quit and sit on, and just sit on my desk. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, one one bullet accidentally misses the marines and the rogue trader is is pulped into oblivion. Yeah, the, yeah. The numbers just don't don't work well together by any means. Um, and that's actually why in a in a weird way, um, even though I love the FFG run to death and I have all of the books, um. I actually, I actually prefer I actually prefer the more standardized approach that Wrath and Glory is doing because it is trying to design itself as the as just straight up the 40k RPG. Yeah, I, I have actually looked a little bit at that, and I didn't I didn't hate it. Um, I, I wish that it had a little more support. Obviously, <laughs> um, well, they... it's um, <laughs> it's it's get it is slowly get it is slowly getting more support. But something okay. something to keep in mind is that um. Um, when Ulysses had it, they barely did anything with it. Yeah. And then Cubicle Seven got a hold of it, and they're doing what Cubicle Seven does best. Mm -hmm. And they and um they ju they just put out a um guide for the Forsaken system, like a, like about yeah. a month ago. So it's it's get it's getting there, but you have to keep in mind they've had the, they've had it for about for about a year. Ah. Uh -huh. And. The, that's in that's in addition to doing to doing stuff for Warhammer Warhammer Fantasy for Age of for Age of Sigmar plus that plus their um and plus their more in-house stuff so mm -hmm. I mean they'll they'll get they'll get there with Wrath and Glory it's just it's just going to take time yeah um that's good i mean i i didn't like i said i didn't hate it when i looked at it and i i do enjoy 40k as a setting yeah. so um but when when it comes to when it when it comes to elder when it comes to elder scrolls now obviously between all between all of the games there's a lot of um a lot of variance when it comes to mechanics spells and the like there's similar things as well but there's a lot of things that are less similar mm -hmm. and one of the one of the things that I'm curious about is when you when when you were start when you were starting to try and improve the the goal, so it wasn't just a hack that you were playing with your college buddies. Um, one, did you did you go back and try and try and play or watch videos of the er, of the early um, entries in the series? Yes, to an extent. Um, not really arena. Um, Daggerfall a little bit. Uh, Daggerfall was more of a lore reference for us. Um, mm -hmm. We 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 kind of dabbled a bit in exploring. Um, Redguard and Battlespire. Um, there's actually we managed to write an entire, basically an entire little supplement for uh, second and third edition, um, based off of the uh, Shadow Key mobile game because we had one dude who happened to know about the game in more than just a, a passing uh, to more than just a passing degree, and so we turned that into its own little thing with Shadow Magic and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're right that things have been have been implemented in drastically different ways over the years in the setting um, in all of Bethesda's various games. And that, that really is the central struggle of creating this kind of a project is, 
I guess, coming to terms with the fact that Bethesda does not care about the kinds of details that matter if you are developing a setting for use as a role-playing game. Because they're making video games. They're, they're making a completely different kind of thing. So it doesn't matter to them, you know, whether or not spells are cast a certain way or can be used to do certain things and whether or not those specifics change in between games because they just want to make a cool game. Whereas for us, we're left to pick up the pieces from a lore perspective in terms of how what does this setting look like to the people who live in it for those of us who want to play in it. And ha are there any instances you can you can think of where um where certain th where certain things that that were in earlier games that got dropped that you that um you felt that you felt sh that you felt shouldn't have been dropped for for this kind of thing oh man um it's hard to get super specific because there was a whole lot of stuff we talked about but i do remember a number of times when discussing um Things like racial attributes uh, for character creation. Um, we would come back to, I think, yeah, we'd come back to Daggerfall um, sometimes. Uh, Anon133 would bring up, um, who he was kind of like my, my partner in crime for many years as we mm -hmm. figured this out. He would always be the one to lean over my shoulder, look at what I've written and say, that's great, but here's the lore problem with that. Uh, he would often be the one to remind me um, when we had crossed a line somewhere or if there was another possibility and he, he would, he'd be sometimes going back to Daggerfall or, or some other thing I had forgotten about um, in the older games to remind me that, Oh, well, there is a precedent for this. Or actually in this game, there's a conflict with the way Skyrim does this thing. Um, and usually that was around uh, either magic um, particular monsters or um, like racial traits and character creation stuff. Mm -hmm. And, now, one of the one of the other entries when it came to drawing inspiration that I that I saw um, posted in the other games part part of the uh, book is Eclipse Phase. Mm, yes. <laughs> which, um, in the interest of full disclosure, I will I will note, um, been a fan of Eclipse Phase for a while, and I had the developer of it on the show um, last year. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I but I really enjoyed. Uh... I never got a chance to play it more than like one time, but I really, really enjoyed just the Eclipse Phase rulebook and everything that went into creating that and the setting and really just everything about it was was really cool to me. Yeah. Um now when it came to when it came when it came to the when it came to the whole inspiration thing, is are there are there any standouts that you can think of as in terms of what you what you specifically drew from? drew from to kind of improve your craft i think the thing that uh eclipse phase allowed us to do or, or at least led us to think about the most was how we were using our core dice mechanic um so i guess if people are not familiar in dark heresy there's a mechanic um, called degrees of success where let's say i'm rolling a d100 for a test my target is a 50 i have to roll below a 50 if I roll a 25, and I believe this was the way they did it in original um, Dark Heresy, my degrees of success would be three. I think you subtract, uh, you know, 20 from 50, basically the tens digits uh, of your rolled number versus your target number. And then that degree of success number is information that the GM can basically pull out of your dice roll to tell you something about what happens. Like, um, oh, you know, you needed this many degrees of success to, to get this extra benefit. So actually, you only get this much of something. Um, Eclipse Phase has a way simpler approach to those things where I believe for them the degrees of success are literally just the dice roll, the result. So it has this interesting, uh, almost kind of like a blackjack system, I think, where uh, you want to roll as high as possible but still below your target number. And I thought that that was a really elegant solution because it meant that you didn't have to do any math. And all the math that you can cut out of the process of rolling dice for the things you're going to be doing repeatedly in a session is mm -hmm. a good cut to make. If you yeah. can make it as simple as possible to resolve an attack, mm -hmm. you should. And so that, at the very least, I know is how we came about doing um, count up degrees of success. Yeah. Um, that was the thing that we, we changed over to. Me personally, I I um I always have a soft spot for how um, Eclipse Phase handles it handles its crits, as mm -hmm. opposed to just rolling as opposed to just rolling really high or really low. Instead, it's uh, it's doing it's double, it um, right? double. Yeah, it's doubles. Yeah. And whether it's a crit success or a crit failure depends on whether or not the roll was a success or failure. Um, yeah. 
I end up liking that a bit more simply because the uh, the odds of the odds of critting in in um in a lot in a lot of in in something like RuneQuest or um or or Dark Heresy is astronomically low, like five mm -hmm. like um le less than five less than five percent. But mm -hmm. because of the f but because of the fact that you're dealing with a D100, you're not having the same you're not having the same five percent bell curve as you would say the D20 system. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's technically five percent, but in re but in reality, because you're still rolling two D10s, it's not. Yeah. And whereas with um, whereas with something like Eclipse Phase, you basically have a ten percent chance. It doesn't sound yeah. like much, but it means, but it mean, yeah, and yeah, ten percent is a lot for sure. Now, a very now a very scub thing that I often see with um, D one hundred systems is that they is that they are very swingy. Yeah, and since we've talked about the kind of periphery with the with these different um, die systems that use a percentile die approach. Um, and I've seen some people try and try and throw in Rollmaster when it comes to um, when it comes to the whole D100 discussion. Except Rollmaster doesn't count because that's roll high. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm curious about is what what do you think? What, in your opinion, are some of the big pitfalls when it comes to uh, that that should be avoided with any sort of D100 system? So I think if you're going to be using D100 for anything, you should embrace the fact that it is basically just a D20 with more information. And the reason that people use the D20 for so much and that it's it's a staple of D&D is that it's simple. It's not a dice pool. You don't have to construct anything complicated, although trust me, I like dice pool systems. I think Genesis is kind of fun, speaking of um, Fantasy Flight. Um, you don't have to construct any dice pools. You don't have to do anything too complicated. And so if you're going to be making a D100 system, you need to lean into that rather than attempting to make it more complex than it lends itself to. Because in that case, you would just be better served with a dice pool or some kind of you know 3D6 or 2D6 uh, kind of a bell curve of, of results. Um, I think that the really the advantage of D100 over a D20 is simply that you have two numbers, right? You have the tens and you have the ones, and you can do a lot with that. Uh, Dark Heresy used those for things like hit locations uh, were based on your dice, um, and I think we we also still do that in in the third edition of UES RPG. Uh, yes. If you happen to need a hit location at random, the GM can just look at the number of the ones digit or something and tell you where you hit on on a humanoid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the tens digit can be used for degrees of success. Um, you know, whether it's roll high or subtraction like like Dark Heresy, you're getting information out of that roll. Um, speaking of, of critical successes, we actually have this kind of fun thing. It, it's, it's a little hokey, but uh, there is an alternative version as well if you don't like this uh, that I think exists in the GM handbook. Um, but we do critical success in the latest version of the UES RPG using lucky numbers, where you literally create at character creation a number of lucky and unlucky numbers equal to your character's luck bonus. Uh, because in the Elder Scrolls setting and in the games, it's such a staple of the games that your luck matters. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea that fate should be shaping uh, the course of events. And so we thought it might be more fun and more interesting if instead of like, oh boy, I have a 3% chance to crit if I happen to roll a, a one, a two, or a three, um, and also a kind of a roll low crit um, doesn't really jive well with our roll as high as possible degrees of success. We thought it'd be kind of fun if, um, it literally was just luck. It was it was just a couple of numbers that if you saw them pop up on the dice, congratulations, you got a crit. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you can use that extra information from the D100 roll in ways that you just can't um, easily with something like a you know a single uh, D20. Yeah, I can I can certainly yes uh, I can certainly see that. Um, and of course, some um, something that I'm I'm fairly certain was that you got the idea from from a rune quest that I that I like you that you've got in 3rd edition is inst is introducing um fighting styles. Ah, yes. Yes. Um, I love that. Largely because it um when when it comes to games that use that use some sort of um use some sort of skill some sort of extensive skill list 
it has always annoyed me to no end when you have a bunch of different um, subtypes for di for different weapons, mm -hmm. and ha and having having to justify. Oh, cool! Like, oh, cool! Like, uh, we found this new weapon is loot, but I don't have any I don't have any skills in it, so I can't use it, even even if you're supposed to be a seasoned adventurer at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Um, I loved combat styles. It was one of my favorite things that we put into the second edition that carried over to third, mm -hmm. um, because in a setting as vast and diverse as the Elder Scrolls especially with the variety of different campaigns that people might want to run based on their own interpretation of that setting. There's no way that just like a, a list of weapons is going to be adequate for all the different types of combat skills people want. And I feel like not only are lists of weapons turning into skills, it's very video gamey, but on top of that, it uh, often makes balancing things really tricky, right? Do you, do you have one-handed weapons be a, a skill? Why not subdivide that further into one-handed blades, one-handed blunt weapons, you know, spears? Um, it just gets confusing, and you end up with some courses of action and character development that are just obviously better because they rely on less investment in skills mechanically, and you can just focus on being really good at one thing. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with combat styles, it's just this is how I my character learned how to fight, and you can flavor those really nicely, right? You can have multiple combat styles that reflect your character's history like uh you know one of our early kind of test games and test characters i remember having a character that was um an ex imperial legionnaire so i had some points into ranks of basically like a legionnaire combat style which is like you know kind of the gladius type weapon shields you know medium heavy armor mm -hmm. um and then more of like a uh kind of assassin rogue you know, bows and short swords and daggers, cloak and dagger kind of uh, combat style um, that I was primarily uh, skilled into. And this, the first one didn't come up too often. It wasn't as mechanically useful for me as the second one, but there was that flavor in my character sheet that, you know, my guy had been a legionnaire before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is much more interesting than just having points in short blade and long blade. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to something like ma when it comes to something like magic, um, even though even though um, as we've mentioned in the past, um, dark heresy was your t was your template early on. Mm -hmm. um, even even in the early days, did how close did you try and have uh, magic resemble the rules for psychers, or did or did you realize early on that that was just not tenable? Oh yeah, we uh, we threw that out pretty much right away. Um, the original, uh, very, very first edition, which again, I, I'm almost hesitant to, talk, hesitant to talk about because it was not very good and I don't think anyone ever played it. Um, but the original very first edition was very much based on the Morrowind kind of style uh, of magic where um, it was almost kind of like, um, it was like a, it was recipes, right? It was like, I want this effect in this form for this duration right? Um, I want a cloak of fire for this long or uh, a cone of cold for this long or whatever. Um, we pretty quickly realized that that was mechanically cumbersome um, and led to weird abuse cases. So we had to sort of move in a more standardized direction. But the trick with that is that what people remember when it comes to the Elder Scrolls magic system, at least from the games, is the freedom of being able to sort of mix and match and, and uh, play with effects a little bit. So we, we had to find a way to kind of create this umbrella under which everything could live. And that immediately involved leaving any fantasy flight psyker inspiration fully behind uh, for something of our own, of our own making. And ob obviously there's the fact that you couldn't, you couldn't use, um, you couldn't use any sort of magic mishaps the same way that there's psychic, the same way that there's psychic mishaps, because, it's kind of hard to do that when when everybody can shit out magic and in, in so easily in the Elder Scrolls universe. Mm -hmm. We actually do have magical mishaps, mm -hmm. but they are uh, they are reserved um, specifically for a, a limited uh, situation uh, or set of circumstances. 
Um, and they are not the worst kind of thing. Like, you know, if you think of Dark Heresy and the psychic mishaps, right, everyone's got the story about how their best friend got swallowed by the warp because they tried to do something really simple with the psychic power, right? Everyone remembers rolling really high on the perils table and summoning a demon. Yeah. Um, but the spell backfires um, that we had were in second and third edition um, relatively uh, tame unless you either got extremely unlucky or or were pumping that number up um, for some reason. And I'm actually looking at the rules right now to remind myself um, of the circumstances in which you triggered them. I know that um, you could you could basically get backfires when it was um, it was critical failures when you were casting uh, what we call unconventional spells, which is basically our our word for custom spells, where you were just matching effects together and like casting multiple effects at the same time. Or if you were trying to cast an effect that was higher than your skill level in that school of magic. So what was kind of neat about that that we thought um, was that, you know, you could have a novice mage attempt to cast some kind of high level spell, but if they screw up, there's actual consequences compared to someone who's more skilled. They can screw up and they're not going to, you know, burn the whole house down. Mm -hmm. no, unless they want to. Oh, yeah. I mean, maybe the goal is to burn the whole house down. I don't know, right? Yeah. <laughs> And when it can now, I I can I kind of touched on this when I mentioned my it my issues with um with get with games that give way too much attention to mages um D and D third edition I'm looking at you <laughs> and that and but that brings me to the talent system that you that you guys had you guys had set up which um um. Is is still in the free form end of things, although it's not. Although it's, although I um. When it came to the design, when it came to the design of that, not was the was was um only war a influence at all, or is that or was that not the case? A little bit. Um, I think what we learned about talents uh, from the earlier editions of the game was that if everything is completely free form, um, then your First off, your balance issues become immediately apparent and exploitable. Um, and second off, people don't necessarily have direction. And there's this balance you need to strike between giving some people some direction, because there's no classes, right? It's not like D&D where people are picking a, to play a barbarian, and it's obvious how their character is supposed to get better. They have to choose from this list, this laundry list of options. And while that is a good thing, a little bit of guidance in terms of giving basically like somewhat uh, talent trees uh, or, or like at least chains, I suppose, of talents gives people somewhere to start. The GM can say like, "Oh, you should start with the brawler talent," and then logically, the person who goes and reads the brawler talent is going to see that they can progress later on to gladiator or god of war or something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't remember all the details of only war's talent system. How how was it different than than dark heresy? Um. The well, for for starters, um. And this was something that this is something that they go a little bit further in when um, when Dark Heresy Second Edition was was announced is is the fact that you're instead instead of doing a first off instead of doing a set career which by the by the time Only War had come out the idea of the idea of career trees had more or less been had more or less been killed off um, mm -hmm. you had you. Like if you look at if you look at how careers worked for Rogue Trader and onward, um, you didn't have you didn't have the side grades at certain rank at certain yeah. ranks anymore. Um, but the the approach that on, the approach that only war had is that your um cur your cur your starting career gave you certain ap gave you certain aptitudes. Some sometimes it was in a general theme. Sometimes it was sometimes that aptitude was based on. One of your um, core, one of your core attributes, one of your core attributes. The thing, the thing with it is that talents, skill increases, and characteristic advances um, were all on were, all, were on a bit more of a universal table. But your aptitudes determined what would be cheaper and what would be more expensive. Oh yeah, okay, that makes sense, and I I definitely see now the the parallel you're drawing. Yeah, we we do basically that. Um, mm -hmm where your characteristics um, specifically um, you know, when you're creating a character, you're, you're defining um, I believe this is still in uh, 
the third edition. You know, it's honestly been a little while since I've played. Um, you know, we've had we've had stages where you're defining favored characteristics and uh, all kinds of different ways of, of pricing things based on what it is that you're kind of trying to um, flavor your character towards. Mm. Um, I'm actually looking at, at the latest version of third edition, and um, I don't think we decided to maintain favored characteristics here. Um, I say we because uh, I basically um, exited the development of the project um, at the end of the second version of the third edition, mm -hmm. the three, two, um, or I guess somewhere after that, um, mostly just because real life got in the way. Um, and so things have been kind of handed off over the next couple of years after that to different people who have been associated with um, the project who have done really awesome things with it. Um, there's been a whole bunch of content that came out that I literally have, have not even had a chance to look over. I've, mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of it, but not all of it. Um, but either way, I, I guess we've, we've dabbled in that sort of thing, like you mentioned with Only War um, over the years, where um, you can flavor what's cheaper for you, but there's still a, um, still a free form Okay, we, we do. I see it there. We do have favorite characteristics in, mm -hmm. in 3v3. Um, you can flavor what's cheaper for you, right? Like this this character is going to be more efficient at advancing in combat-related skills and talents, but that doesn't mean that the wizard can't do it. And that's that's a staple of Elder Scrolls as a game it has always been this appeal of, oh, it's a sandbox where I can just play whatever weird character I want to play. I want to play a wizard who punches people or, uh, you know, a fighter who's also sneaky and yep. blah, blah, blah. And I find it. I find that talents are 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 work, work better here than when they tried to introduce them into um, Skyrim. Because when they introduced the whole talent constellation thing to try and to try and weasel out of making classes, mm -hmm. um, the problem that I had with that at the time was the was the fa was the fact that it dis it disincentivizes. Um, the kind of experimentation that's always been at the hallmark of the Elder Scrolls sandbox. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like once you once you start going on a certain path with talents, you're you're gonna have you're not gonna have as much incentive to have a jack of all trade jack of all trades or jack of many trades approach. Mm -hmm. You're gonna you're gonna be more and more hyper focused. Yeah. And a problem a problem that I have a problem that I have with um with with it is that if if somebody wants to be hyper focused yeah then f then fine but there should be some there should be something to balance them out between the people who are go are going to be a bit more generalist now obviously mm -hmm. it's a little obviously if you're doing straight up classes it's kind of hard to have a more generalist type of, type of character which is one of the many reasons why bards get such a bum rap <laughs> but when it come, but um, and you can't you, you kind of had an inverse of of this in um in in um stuff like World of Warcraft when they when they started introducing more and more classes that could fill multiple roles in the Trinity, but mm -hmm. the single role classes weren't given something to compensate. Mm -hmm. Um, some a lot, some games are going to go one way or the other, which is perfectly fine. There's nothing there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with that, but if if you're gonna if you're gonna claim that you're accommodating both, um, actually accommodate both. <laughs> mm. um, at, at least that at least that's that's all my that's my take with it. Um, yeah, and, the the difference between sort of the go wide character and the and the build tall character, right? The the one who's who's a jack of all trades versus a specialist is hard because it also and I learned this from both the feedback that we got and from the games that I've played and GM'd myself, the balance, so to speak, of a game, and really when we talk about balance, let's not lie, we're talking about combat, right? That's, mm -hmm. you know, D&D &D is practically a war game that has RPG elements stapled onto it. Um, and most RPGs in this kind of genre are. They, they are very focused on combat mechanics. Go pay attention to how many pages they devote to combat versus other kinds of things. Oh well, yeah, um, if you want if you wanted something more narrativistic, you'd be playing Fate. Yeah, exactly. Right, and, and people come to these kinds of games because they don't just want to walk and talk and walk and talk in the Elder Scrolls. They want to go fight monsters and do heroic things and whatever your campaign is. But my my point, I guess, um, is that balance really is something that cannot be divorced from 
the kind of game the GM is trying to run. And what we realized when putting together the UES RPG is that not only has Bethesda created so many different versions of their own setting across the different games by the way that they have changed their own mechanics and lore to justify those mechanics, but people have so many different ideas about what the setting is from their level of exposure, right? The hardcore lore junkies, you know, are live in a completely different world when it comes to the setting compared to someone who's only played Skyrim or Tez Online. So we kind of tried to aim for this system that was um, a little toolboxy. We weren't we weren't trying to lean too hard in any one direction, and we wanted to leave enough up on the table that a GM could pick and choose the parts they like to fit the kind of game they were running in a way that hopefully would result in a more cohesive experience for them without us having to create a cohesive set of mechanics for you know the 16 billion different types of games you could try to run within the setting. Mm -hmm. So what that form that really took was um, flexibility of character creation, of course, um, some optional rules and flexibility for the GM in the GM content, um, and dividing up our um, content into supplemental documents very heavily. Um, you know, things like uh, having your lycanthropy, your werewolf rules, your vampirism rules, your uh, your weird types of magic, your uh, your monster manual type stuff existing in a f more fragmented form where the GM could say, okay, we're going to use these parts, but not these parts. Mm -hmm. Now, the danger with that is you, you can become GURPS if you do it too much, right? Where you have 50 books or 100 books and the GM says, oh yeah, we're just going to play out of these seven or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the new players are drowning in options. Um, I think we did a decent job of striking a balance where we don't actually have that many books. They're all pretty self-explanatory from the title, but we spun off we spun off a lot of things that people may or may not actually care about. So they're free to ignore those and focus on just the core of what they care about for their campaign. Yep. Um, now it's at this point where I have to address one of the one of the big elephants in the room that became a fucking meme when Sky, when Skyrim came out and mm -hmm. address and address some um, shouts. Aha, yes, 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 yes. Now, was when it came to sh when it came to shouts, was that was that something that there was a fair amount of internal debate about how to even do it? <sighs> yeah, to an extent. Um, and I'm actually right now, just so I can I can be super uh, clear about this, I'm pulling up the rules so that I can remind myself of exactly what the current state is in third in third edition v three. Um, but I I mean. 90% of, of that stuff I would have written at some point myself anyway. Pretty much all, all the words on most of the pages you see in this in this book had to flow through my keyboard. It's just, it all gets jumbled. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So to to some extent with both uh, the Thum, which is the, you know, the shouts, um, and also with especially the very obscure things like the, the sword singing, which is really a mechanic that only is alluded to in, in the most fringe of lore documents and is never spotlighted in any games. Um, and the shadow magic, which only exists in a freaking mobile game, the Shadow Key mobile game, um, we basically sat down and asked ourselves what... Um, what freedom we had based on what framework Bethesda had laid down. Not because we necessarily care about Bethesda's opinion, but because that's what people expect, right? When people come into the Elder Scrolls with knowledge of something, just like with any setting, um, they are going to look to see mechanics that are familiar. So we do have, you know, when it comes to to shouts, we kind of have this idea of from Skyrim of, of levels of a shout involving added words. You know, if you go and look at the the document, um, which I'm looking at right now, uh, and any given shout, like we actually have the little draconic symbols that go there with each of the shouts, and a lot of them are taken um, taken out of Skyrim because there was such a strong mechanical foundation built for that that we felt it would be very strange for us to choose to diverge there from what people would expect for no other reason than maybe we thought we could do it better, but we didn't. We didn't have some other vision necessarily for something that up until that point in the lore had been extremely vague, right? There was really almost no definition about what could be done with the voice until Skyrim came along and turned it into a very simple set of video game mechanics. Um, I'd like to think that we we did add some flexibility to to break out a little bit of the mold that Skyrim created for us, but that was a case where we really had to, to tack very closely to to what Bethesda did, whereas with like um, sword singing and the shadow magic and kind of the crazier stuff, um, 
we were free to experiment and just do what we felt fit. Mm-hmm. And what give now given given all of given all of that, um, I re- I realize I realize that there's. There's always going to be a lot. There's always going to be a lot of work to do to do when it comes to a project like this, mm-hmm. and e- even with the even with the baker's dozen of um, scrolls and expansions that you get that you've that you've put out. But um, where do you what do you see he- what do you see heading down the pipeline as far as what's currently being wor- what's currently being worked on to expand the sandbox of UES RPG? We're in a very interesting spot right now, actually, um, where not a lot is happening, unfortunately, um, and understandably, because there's kind of a few ways that a project like this moves forward. And I, when I started thinking about second edition, um, and I had been talking to people on IRC, and we eventually moved off of IRC, uh, who had been engaged in other TG-based um, fan projects, um, I started looking at the atmosphere, or not the atmosphere, the um, the, the sphere of fan projects and thinking about what makes a, su- a successful fan project. And what I saw as a prime example of a problem was what happened with um, Adeptus Evangelion, which is the sort of dark heresy into Evangelion hack that mm-hmm. existed, I think still exists in oh, some yeah, form. It, it, do, it does. Um, in fa- and I, I reviewed, um, I reviewed third edition of the third edition oh, wow. of that a while back when the, the thing that the thing that I noticed when it came to that, and may, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this might be where you're going with this, is that um, the side additions got a little out of hand. Yes, that's absolutely where I was going to go. Um, there's this very interesting line between you need a community so you can have feedback and ideas, but you also need something of a central vision so that you do not divulge or diverge into these crazy branching pathways where everyone is doing something different and no one is pooling their resources. Mm -hmm. Personally, I have no problem with people doing different things with anything we create. Like I have no ownership really beyond just being able to say, I typed a lot of this stuff and came up with a good amount of the the raw text on the page. And we have other spinoff versions of the UES RPG. There's at least two I know of that are actively discussed on our discord. And I have no problem with people talking about that. That's cool. Um, But when it came to the, the core development of what I was involved in making, It was this interesting balancing act between I was trying to get people involved who knew a lot more than I did about game design, and I was trying to give them a lot of power and input, but also I was trying to keep one hand on the wheel in terms of the overall direction of things to make sure that it felt cohesive, because these fan projects can very quickly come apart if someone is not doing that. and I, I, I think I'm happy with the balance we struck. The result, though, is that when you do not have those people driving things forward, or at least people who are in the position to be in the driver's seat, um, I... driving things forward, then things don't happen. And right now, basically everyone who's involved in the project has real life stuff going on mm-hmm. that has precluded a lot of possible um, future plans. We, we have been kicking around the idea of a fourth edition in the future. Um, the reason that we haven't gone anywhere with that yet is that we're almost kind of waiting to see what Bethesda does, because the other thing that really enabled, um, us to get the, the kind of community we have, and we have a decent number of people who follow our game, not huge by any means, but not tiny either. Um, the, the thing that enabled us to do that was that a lot of the buzz around, Elder Scrolls was going on at the same time that I was posting on TG, um, and that was around the release of ESO. There was mm-hmm. interest. There hasn't been a mainline Elder Scrolls game in ten years. People just don't care as much. People, There's not people coming in. I um I think I think the other I think the other problem when it comes to that is um, Bethesda has not exactly do, has not exactly done themselves any favors in the oh, la- yeah. in the last few years with their <laughs> litany of bad decisions and Absolutely. the la- the most recent. Well, game if you want if you want to qualify it when it comes to the Elder Scrolls officially from them is Elder Scrolls Blades and um I don't know about you but I do not want that on my resume. Yeah, never even touched it, never even looked at it. I'm afraid to even think about it. I, <laughs> I'm sure it's not great. I looked at the I looked at the footage 
when it was initially announced and it was referred to as a true Elder Scrolls experience on mobile and immediately my bullshit alarm goes off. And yeah. then I was sent a extensive review of it by um t by a friend of mine when um Tear of Grace reviewed it, which is saying mm -hmm. something because he hasn't he doesn't do reviews that often. And my expectations were low, but holy fuck! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I can I can imagine how how on mobile that would that would go sideways very quickly. It's like I I. I don't have. I never have high hopes whenever whenever something go whenever something is on mobile. It's not. It's not that I don't think you can make a good game on mobile. I've seen it happen. It's just hasn't happened enough to what to warrant to warrant a any bit of um, optimism. But I'd but I'd say that I'd, there's also the fact that um the. Uh, that attempt that attempted a card that attempted a card game not too long ago didn't exactly l didn't exactly last, largely because it was trying to pick a fight with Hearthstone, and oh, yeah. that was a That's... bad idea. Mm -hmm. The best thing for us that came out of uh, Legends, which was the the card game, was the art. There's so much of it, and oh oh my god, it was it was a godsend oh, because there... we we need art that we can uh, blatantly slap into our. Uh, fan PDFs <laughs> for yeah. the things. Yeah, there's there's no shortage of great art in the, in that card game. the the prob the problem what the problem was the um the card game d didn't do enough to distinguish itself from the kind of gameplay loop that you would see in um, Hearthstone. Mm -hmm. And granted, there were cert there are certainly worse games that were tr that were trying to. Um, they were trying to they were trying to ride the coattails of of Hearth of Hearthstone around that time, artifact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the but the fa the fact of the matter is is that but even even with the tease of an Elder Scrolls Six, there's a lot of unanswered questions that Bethesda is not comfortable with a with answering right now. Chief among them being, are they still going to use the I know. Okay, I, I know that they claim that um, Sky, Skyrim and Fallout 4 were made on the creation engine. That's technically true, but not entirely. Um, mm. The creation engine is ju is just a duct taped up version of their of their previous Gamebryo engine. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and it's oh, Gamebryo is. That's a whole other can of worms. But yeah, no, it, I, I know what you're. I know what you're. You're thrusting out here. They they need a new engine so desperately. Like a proper one, <laughs> yeah. And this this whole thing of ju of just of just trying to um just trying to bork up um Gamebryo, which is basically what Creation Engine is, and it could it could barely it could barely handle last gen hardware, and they want to and they want to try and run that on um, PS5 and Series X. <laughs> yeah. Um. Plus there, plus there was all the stuff that happened with Fallout seventy six, which is go which is going to be a meme for the rest of my life because it's never going to get finished. Oh yeah, that game. Ugh. Oh. What a failure! <laughs> like on a on a on a really massive scale, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of rare that you see things like that happen. But given what you mentioned and the comparison that you made with um Adeptus Evangelion, it sounds that to me like one of the one of the main priorities that you have is set is setting up. For lack of a better term, a series bible, and the other the other major um, success story that comes to mind when it comes to big um, big TG projects, even if a lot of it was started off as just a one man project, is the ludicrous insanity that is Dungeons of the Dragoning that didn't really have that kind of splitting. Mm -hmm. It's like, I actually I actually might might disagree with the the phrase series bible i mean i guess it depends on how you're how you're um, using it i i will freely admit that i'm blatantly stealing the the term series bible from television production got it um because with, with a lot of with television production that's run properly you have you have this you have this kind of all in all in one all in one bible that you can that you can draw reference on when it comes to the important story beats, the important ki the important characters, basically as a means to keep everything relatively consistent. Yeah. So you mean you mean like from a lore and mechanics perspective? A yeah. Kind of Bible. 
and and I, it's it's interesting. I address this actually in the intro for the game. Um, there's a section called lore, design, and canon. Mm-hmm. And canon is a very uh, a very fuzzy word when it comes to the Elder Scrolls, especially when you start talking to people who are really into the lore. Um, but I, I like to think of it as um, this is our version of our interpretation of the setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've aimed for something that's a little more, if you can say, realistic, a little more grounded, um, but also has it's it's perhaps like you know more more lethal in some ways and gritty than D and D might be, but also allows for some of the the peaks of heroism that you would expect out of the Elder Scrolls setting. And the goal was more of a toolbox that reflects our interpretation of the setting because there's no way that we can we could even attempt really. Um, to create a Bible, so to speak, for a setting that is as contradictory, conflicting, confusing, and uh, multifaceted as Mm -hmm. as Elder Scrolls has been. Yeah. And I, I could, I can certainly, I can certainly see that kind of thing. Um, but, but I do, I do, I do wish the, I do wish the best of luck on the, on the matter. And just so I, just so I don't jinx anything. Um, and with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity here. Of course, thank you for having me. It's been fun. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, if we do a uh, a fourth edition, I'll come back with a drink. How does that sound? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be for a for a um for a new edition for a new edition per se. If it if it's just a matter of just wanting to shit post, I'm 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 always gonna be all ears. Well, yeah, that's what we're all about. Sounds good. I'll let you know. Thank you. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>